I, I have a technical background, and, and so I kind of got back into computers when the web was coming up. And so we started this firm, a partner and I. Uh, I continue to work with him on startups. Um, and this started in 95. We got a little bit of friends and family money for our seed money. And uh, as the internet caught on, we provided web services both on the interface side as well as on the back end side. And the back end in those days, for anybody that's technical, was Perl and CGI scripts. There were no, there was no infrastructure, no platforms, not even relational databases. We used flat file databases. Uh, I did my first commerce system in 1995, you know, where we're taking credit cards online. The SSL was secure, but we had to play tricks to keep them on the server <coughs> securely uh, so they couldn't get stolen if somebody was going to hack us. So it was just, just funny stuff like that. So anyways, we got, um, we thought big. Web associates, we thought network associates, computer associates will be web associates. So we were thinking big. And there were a lot of other companies called web associates, so we actually had to go through a process of buying name, buying our name, buying the domain, all this sort of stuff, um, and pushing the other guys out of the, out of the way. So this went very well. We got HP as a client in 1996 first external web firm, got Apple in 1997, first external web firm in Apple. Uh, Lucent Technologies, which you guys may or may not remember, we did their first corporate website, as well as a, a global content management system for all their sales offices. Um, I, on the technical side, I developed all the, uh, the architecture and the, the design for these things based on what the customers were asking for. So in those days, you got to invent things on the internet. Nowadays, it's a lot harder to invent things. Anyways, this grew pretty well. In 2007, uh, we sold it hostily to our investor. He took it over. Um, so be careful of investors. And I have a slide about investors later on. Um, and, uh, and he turned it around three years later. So we sold it for $10 million hostily in 2007. And he turned it around three years later, after the economic crisis, and sold it for $40 million to Rosetta. So we were sort of deprived the first 30 employees. We spread shares around so everybody had a little bit of it, but we were all deprived of a really good upside. We got some cash, but we didn't really get a, a big, strong exit. Um, I've done a lot of other startups in between. I'm involved with a couple startups right now. Um, the original partner on Web Associates, uh, he and I have, have opened up a web agency again because we know this business very well. We've been at it for 15 years, and so so that's a not really that innovative of a, of a startup, but the compelling proposition is doing large large agency work with a small team. So you know we've worked with large agencies, we've been a large agency, but we liked it small projects where we got our hands on and we could really deal with the people and you know provide good service for, for a reasonable price. So we've been getting asked a lot to do projects, and so we finally launched a firm this year uh, to do those things. Um, I am involved with some innovative things too, some security uh, startups. Um, uh, I'm advising a very interesting startup in Poland right now, which has got a gateway-less uh, VPN system um, for private surfing right now, but then we'll roll it into business so businesses can use it. So. I like technology, I like clever things. Uh, if I see something that's interesting, I can usually put together the pieces to find a market and, and, uh, and turn it into a viable business. Um, doesn't mean I'm rich, it just means I like working with technology and startups. Um, coaching is something I've really gotten into in the last couple of years. Uh, so I work with quite a lot of startup companies. I kind of have an open door for startups. If it's interesting and clever and they need some advice, as long as, as long as I have time, I'll talk to you, you know, on Skype or email or whatever. So uh, same goes for you guys, that if, if you guys are, if you've got an interesting startup and it catches my attention, then, then I can uh, give, you some, give you some advice or answer a tough question. Um, Web Associates, we put together a board of advisors back in 1995 because there were a lot of things I didn't know. So we got a finance guy, and my dad was an advisor, and we got a technology guy to kind of sit on top of the company that we could ask the tough questions to. So board of advisors is a good thing to put together, and you can usually do those for free at the beginning. Later on, you can issue them some shares. 
that's what we did. So we had a board of five and we gave 1% to each one of the early advisors uh, because of the, the help they had given. Okay, anyways, so today uh, I'm going to talk about uh, I'm going to talk about how to present your company and a little bit, I think that's supposed to be my last slide. <laughs> Wait, I guess I got, oh, I guess it's a little out of work. Okay, well anyways. Um, I had a bad experience with investors. So in companies, it's always a good idea if you can try to build the company to generate revenue and maybe take some friends and family money in, but formal investors aren't thinking like you guys are thinking. You're thinking about creating, making value, working hard, taking risk. Okay, That's not what investors think about. And I have a slide later on where I'll talk about my impressions of investors about what they're looking for and what their predisposition is because you're presenting to investors to get judged to move on to the next level. I didn't want to interrupt you, Please. but I think that this slide is, uh, slide is good. I have my investors meeting <laughs> of neurology, so uh, my investors are going to kill me because I'm taking care of a lot of startups and not uh, the, the real business yet. So I have, uh, I'm sorry, I, I have to leave and I will join you around uh, noon and uh, discuss other things. So okay. thank well, you. Good luck with your uh, investors. Yeah, they are, <laughs> they are not thinking like me. <laughs> no, they, they think differently. So no, but still I think that uh, investors that needed it in Slovakia, so I am. Well, the main thing is if you can figure out a clever business model to generate revenue right away, maybe doing yeah. something different while you're, while you're rolling out your main offering to the marketplace. But you have to be also fast, you know, so, you know. Yeah, yeah. You have, you yeah compressing time is a key thing, so. Anyways, we'll see you later. Yeah. So, but, okay, so I just want you to keep that in mind. Investors aren't the answer for everything. Getting an investor means you've got somebody else with other agendas that are now part of your business, right? They're looking out for their interests. So just keep that in mind. It's not the answer to get an investor. Um, it's, it's a necessary evil in many cases. In California, we call venture capitalists vulture capitalists. So um, I'm sure you guys have heard that before. Okay, when you're presenting your company, Okay, this is a slide that, uh, that came from the Startup Week in Vienna uh, about three or four weeks ago. We had um, 50 companies getting selected down to 10, and then the 10 presented, and the winner was a company called My Sugar out of Vienna, which are some guys that were involved with Start Europe in the early days. And um, yeah, they got a trip to Silicon Valley, and they got a uh, $30,000 uh, or Euro media budget, and some nice prizes for this. Anyways, when they were when there was the talk on presentations there, I saw this really good slide and it had never really been put so clearly to me. And so, um, when you're going to present something, okay, um, first of all, the obvious intuitive thing is: is it very important or is it less important? What I'm doing right now, okay? I mean, this whether it's to a customer or to or to an investor or to a partner or something like that, you can gauge how important is it, but. The interesting thing for me was informational pitches. I come from a technology background, so I was used to talking about technology and information. Okay, But if some people don't have interest in hearing that story because they don't know why they should be interested, the presentation goes much more towards the pitch side, which is trying to convince them that what you're going to say is interesting and that it's important. Okay? and that you want them to engage in that idea and listen to the details. Because if you don't catch them right away, then it doesn't matter how elegant your technology is and your algorithms and all that sort of stuff. That's all informational stuff. The pitch stuff is getting their attention. Okay, And in most times when you're talking to an investor or investment group to begin with, you've got to get their attention. Okay, And I have, I have some... I mentioned the investor slide that I have here. I'll talk to you about some of the reasons why it's really important to get them hooked right away. It's important to get everybody hooked right away so that they'll listen to your pitch, but especially with investors. So, um, if you think about a presentation as telling a story, okay, uh, humans have a long background or a long history in stories. Okay, we like stories. Parents tell stories, grandparents tell stories, we tell stories, some are truthful, some are lies, but we like stories. So if you think about your presentation as a story, 
then that's a way to engage people. That's a way to, to, to use the same kind of principles that you have in a story. Um, and and it's, a, it's a good way to think about it. Instead of thinking, uh, what am I going to say out there? Just go up and tell the story of your company. Okay? When, when people, lawyers, things like this are in court, you know, doing, arguing a case or something like this, they're telling stories, okay? Uh, politicians standing up on, up on stage saying, yeah, we're going to save you. They're telling stories, so everybody likes stories. So you have to think about, from your investor standpoint, okay, what's the purpose of your story? Well, we know we want to get the investors interested. You want to win the competition. That's the purpose of the story, okay? <clears throat> Understand your audience, okay? Um, if I came up here and started speaking about, about uh, advanced math topics, okay, probably wouldn't be interesting, especially to investors. Most investors are not that technical. They just want to know, how am I going to make money on this? How, am I going to prote how is this company going to protect against competition? They don't want to know the details. That comes later. That's more informational. First, they want to know that you've got a good story with a good hook. We do this. Well, I'll get into the details a little bit more, but understand your audience. Don't speak to them in words that they don't understand. You have to understand who they are and what their background is, and then you can best tell a story that matches to them. A pitch is not one pitch that you give to all people. A pitch should be catered to your audience, so it fits the audience well. Okay? I have done a lot of sales in my history, and if you have an engineer as a client, the story is different than if you have a business guy as somebody that you're trying to sell to. You emulate your audience. That's what the, the famous sales line is. Emulate your audience. Okay? If you're going to go meet with somebody that's all dressed up in a tie and is like this, then you show up in a tie. You don't show up in casual clothes. If the guy you're meeting with to try to convince of something is wearing a t-shirt and shorts and sandals, you better show up that way. Emulate who you're speaking with. Emulate your customer. That's the famous line. So um, use analogies or analogs. Um, if it takes three minutes to explain that you've got a new content aggregation and syndication platform, blah, 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 like this, if you use the analog, say, well, we're the YouTube of text. Something like that. Use an analog, simple, simple story so that they get the idea that, oh, it's like this. They don't have to understand it yet, but they go, oh, it's like this. So try to simplify things to, to analogs that people understand, common society analogs that people understand. Okay, um, practicing. Uh, I use Steve Jobs as a great example on this. He goes up and gives his famous Apple Talks. He gave his famous Apple Talks, okay? And everything looks natural, and he, he doesn't say that much, and his timing is perfect. Everything he does, that's because he spends 30 days practicing it. He does it over and over again until it looks natural and easy and smooth. So that's one of the keys to his success, is lots of practice to make it look smooth and natural, as though he just stood up there and is saying the thing for the first time. Uh, he's been working on it for 30 days. He's been choosing every word, everything he's going to show, all the timings, everything there is very well orchestrated. So practice is very important. Any questions so far? You guys are fine to interrupt me if you want to interrupt me. I'm not a sequential guy. I jump around quite a bit. Um, uh, kind of a final point, and this is something that, uh, that I had to learn the hard way. It's, it's not necessarily what you say, but how you say it, okay? And by how you say it is if you're saying something with confidence, even if you screw up a few of the words, they're still going to feel like you're confident, okay? So it's important to think in terms of how are you going to say what you're going to say because the, the nonverbal communications in a dialogue or an exchange are very significant, maybe 50%, maybe greater than the actual words that are being said. So just bear in mind, depending on your audience, it's how you say it is equally important to what you say. Okay? And as I mentioned, I'll distribute these slides. Okay, investor is an audience. I mentioned earlier, you've got to get their interest quickly. Okay? Because they're very busy guys. 
Okay, you got to get them hooked with something. We do this. This is unique. This is going to save the world. This is going to change the world. You know, something interesting. Um, keep the story simple. Okay, kiss. I'm sure you guys have already. Everyone's heard this. There's kiss with two s's. Is keep it simple, stupid. Um, <laughs> Because, uh, I mean, I used to tell very long stories when I didn't need to. Especially, I love technology and I get passionate about it. And ten minutes later, I realized that it wasn't important that I was going into all the details, uh, the technical minutia. Um, from the standpoint of the timing that you guys have, there'll be a certain amount of time. I don't know what, what's four the... Four minutes. Four minutes? Four pitch and four minutes per person. Okay. Make sure you cover all your main points, okay? There's nothing more disappointing than getting two-thirds of the way through your pitch and you don't get to cover business model or something because you run out of time because you spent too much time describing how elegant and unique your, your solution is and how it works. Investor doesn't need to know how it works. He needs you to say, this is unique and interesting. We've done substantial research to prove this. And later on, you go and you cover the details about how something works with the investor. When you, when you pitch to an investor, you want to get him interested and engaged, okay, as simply as possible, so he wants to come back and talk to you more at a separate meeting. You can't do everything in four minutes. You just got to get through your main points, okay? And I'll cover what those points are in a minute with you. So I mentioned, uh, I mentioned earlier about using analogies and analogs. Try to make your story simplified by using, using these types of things, okay? Um, there's a company in Vienna that I'm working with that does syndicate content from bloggers and they've got a semantic search system that makes it much better. It's called Newsgrape. And this is their, their analog, so I'm just stealing it from them, right? We're, we're the YouTube of text. So I don't know what that means exactly, but it makes you feel like you know what it means. Like, oh, okay, it's going to help spread text around and become very popular, okay? But that's, uh, but that's a really important point. Okay, so what are investors like? Um, okay, we all like risk, okay? We, we do stuff because we believe in it. Investors don't like risk, okay? Investors are the most conservative bunch of people. Angels are a little bit different than, I'll call it institutional investors, but basically investors don't like risk. So don't appeal to them taking a shot here. You know, roll the dice with us. Okay, they like, they like to make the best methodical choices about which company to put the money into. Okay, secondly, um, back up your facts with research, okay? They will not believe your assumptions, okay? You may believe your assumptions, you may be fooling yourself a bit in believing your assumptions, but they're not. Make sure you back everything up with research and facts. That's what they will believe. They'll believe what is on a report somewhere, Gartner Group said this, Wall Street Journal said this, New York Times said this, um, this magazine said this, okay? If you say, I've been looking at the market and I see this, and it, they're, gonna, they're not going to believe you. Those are your assumptions. Unless you have proven them with your business and say, I believe this, and then we did these things, and that proved this assumption, okay, which you aren't at yet because you're out telling them that you want to do this company and you want to win the prize or you want to get investment. So back everything up with research. Um, especially, and I'll mention it later on, especially your competition. You have to know what other companies are doing. Okay, I saw some pitches last Thursday at the Start Vienna, and a guy, uh, uh, Jose, I forgot his last name. Anyways, he had a clever buying system, okay? And he believed he was the only one like that. He thought, wow, I really have a breakthrough here. And then in the audience, they're pretty informed people. They weren't investors, but they were other startups. They said, Oh, this is like that. They're doing this, and, and, the, and, the, and, and the Jose was up there going, really? Oh, I didn't know that. So you have, to, you have to really understand your competition. Understand what are your unique selling points and your competitive advantage, because that's something that investors are going to look for. They want to make sure that there's a place for you and that you aren't doing a Me Too product just like somebody else has already done that's already farther ahead of you. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, let's see. Um, investors are busy, okay? They are looking at a lot of companies. Uh, typical VCs in California are getting, you know, 100 to 250 business plans a month. How do you stand out? Okay, 
very difficult to stand out. If you get a chance where you're pitching to them, where you're talking to them, you got to grab their interest right away. Okay? You've got to have a hook, something like that, because investors are barraged with opportunities. Okay? And one of the ways that they filter down those opportunities is they have segments that they focus in, things that the investors or the investment company understands. Uh, certainly a lot of the Central European investment firms are focused on Web 2.0 and the app market. That's something that's really simple to understand. Uh, it's sexy. Um, uh, a famous quote from Dr. Michael Fisk, who's a guy that I invested in, uh, security business. Um, he said, the venture capitalists are like sorority girls. When one of them is wearing pink and pink is in, then they all wear pink. So it's like they aren't brilliantly intelligent, the, the, the venture capitalists. They're following the trends. What is the trend? They go with that. If people are wearing pink, they put on pink. Next year it's green and they all wear green. So they follow trends. They're not looking necessarily to, to, to step outside of what everybody else is doing. They're just looking to pretty much go in the same direction and maybe do it a little bit better. So, uh, so investors follow trends. And for, for filtering out companies to look at or not, they generally stay in segments. You know, they're IT, telco, media, you know, these kinds of segments. So even if you've got a great plan, I learned this early on, if the investor doesn't invest in those segments, you're wasting your time talking to him. Unless you can hook him and he'll say, wow, that's really great, not my segment, but here, call this guy. This guy is focused on your segment, and he'll give you a really good referral. So, and that's another quick point about investors, and that is you can tell them your story, and even if they're not going to invest, they can refer you to somebody that's interested in your story, okay? So it's always a chance to ask them for a little bit of help. Ask investors for advice. This is just a technique. I don't have it in my slides, but it just comes to mind, and that is that every time I talk to somebody, Okay, whether I'm trying to sell something or work on investment or something like that, I try to open the door by asking for advice. Okay? Hey, I got this thing I'm working on. Can I you know, talk to you about it for a couple of minutes and get your advice on it? Advice is something that people will give pretty easily. If you're saying, I want to see if you're going to invest in our company, you're almost going to get a no automatically. But if you ask for advice, then they'll say, well, I wasn't clear on your story, but maybe talk to this guy because he knows more. Or another guy in our firm is focused on this. Here, talk to blah, 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 blah. So ask for advice, okay? It's the same thing with customers. When you're doing market research, don't go in and say, I'm going to sell you my new GPS widget. Say, we've got something we're working on, and i just like your advice, so you th you know, what you think about this. Ask them what they think about it instead of saying, do you want to buy this? If, if you're going to put them in a defensive mood, if you, if you ask, do you want to buy this, or are you going to invest in this? But if you ask for advice from investors or advice from potential customers, then it's a soft, it's a soft kind of speaking arrangement. So that's, uh, that's something that, that uh, I've used over and over again, and it seems to work pretty well. Um, plans and team. Okay? Investors, I've found, invest in people almost more than any particular idea. A good team, okay, or a fair team with a great idea will probably screw up the great idea. A great team with a fair idea can shift and morph that idea into some kind of a winner that can be successful. So investors understand this, uh, and this is something that I learned the hard way, but Make sure that your team presents well and present your team along with the idea. If you're just saying, here's our idea, and you've got contact on the last slide of one individual, okay, you're not giving the, the investor a chance to see what the team looks like and to show, wow, we've got a great developer, we've got a great business guy. You know, Cover the team. It's important to cover the team. That's also why it's important to build a good team. Okay, different kinds of investor pitches. Everyone's heard of the elevator pitches. It's like, make your story great in 30 seconds. you got to have that kind of a shorty. Somebody says, hey, what do you do? Okay, Don't go into technical details. Just give it a quick high level, two, three, four sentences maximum that kind of discover, that kind of presents what you do and why it's unique and why it's interesting and 
kind of what's happening with it. So uh, elevator pitches are important. Okay, investor presentation, which is what we're going to focus on today. You've got a four minute allocated time. Um, another thing to prepare for ahead of time is what are the questions that investors are going to ask you? Okay, now if you've never presented to investors, you'll have a harder time coming up with those. But when you pitch over and over again, okay, you start understanding what the kind of questions that they ask are. You can come up with good answers ahead of time. And if you know what you're going to say and they ask you the question, then you can make a smooth delivery that makes them feel confident that you understand what you're talking about. So after the presentation, you want to get to questions and answers with the investor. Um, so think about what it is they're going to ask and make sure you've got a good answer for it. Okay. Um, last point. Okay. Competition. Okay. I mentioned that earlier. Okay. Understand what else is out there. Understand why you're better. Understand what their weaknesses are. Um, don't tell the investor that they're a shitty company and they're not interesting. Just simply say uh, that. Well, they have these kinds of these. They have these kinds of weaknesses that we feel, and in the design of our company, uh, we we've, we've made strengths in these areas. So we think we have the best chance in the long run. Okay, but understand your competition. I, I told you the story about Jose. It's Jose Luis, now that I remember his name. Okay. Also, within a startup, every member of the startup needs to be able to talk about the company. You can't just have the CEO up there, and you have a technical guy, and you have a market, well, business guy, it's kind of implied that he needs to be able to talk about it. But everybody in a small company needs to be able to tell the story to anyone that asks. And you should work on this so it's a consistent story. So you don't have the engineer telling one story about what your company does and the CEO telling what should be the same story, and his story sounds completely different, okay? That's something you can do. It doesn't cost that much. It just means it's a little bit of preparation on your side, so everybody can tell the story. Especially if you're getting into due diligence, they want to see consistency. It's just like brand consistency in a large corporation. Large corporations spend a, long, a lot of time on brand consistency. How is the brand message delivered? You know, what's the tagline, right? Everybody has to learn that within a company. You do the same thing, even though you're just a startup, make a consistent story. Have the engineers practice it as well. So if an engineer has to talk about the company because the CEO can't make it, the engineer can do at least a, a reasonable presentation about the company. Okay, um, I have six points, I think. Maybe it's seven, let's see. Nope, six points. Six points that are standardly in, a, in an investor presentation. You've got four minutes to cover it. This is my opinion. There is no absolute answer for this, okay? I'm just saying this is what I found in my years of pitching. And I will close with an interesting story about how Web Associates got funded, because um, it was exactly in this kind of environment. We were in a competition, um, and we got, we got funded. This was way back in 1998 or 1999. It was one of the early Southern California uh, presentation competitions. 350 investors in the audience. And I had to go up and talk. <laughs> so, um, okay, standard things. Um, just briefly, who are we? What do we do? And cover the team. Okay? Um, that should be pretty straightforward. This is critical. What's the problem that you solve? Okay? If you can't identify what the problem you're solving is, like we put together this great technology platform, blah, 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 blah. doesn't matter. What's the problem that you solve? That has to be really keyly or clearly articulated to people, okay? Over and over again, what's the problem you're solving? That's usually my first question of any company that I'm talking to. What is it the problem that you're solving? Because it's not always clear to everyone else what your problem is that you're solving. Maybe clear to you because you're immersed in the company and what you've come up with your solution, but you have to be able to clearly articulate what is the problem that you're solving, okay? So you can say, what's the problem you solve and how do we solve it? We use a technology platform to do this. We blah, 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 okay? Um, very key to investors, especially when you get into venture capitalists, okay? How big is the market, all right? How big is this thing? If it's a problem that's a very, very teeny, teeny, tiny little market, it's not interesting. Even if you get a 90% market share of a teeny, teeny market, it's not interesting, okay? So how big is the market? Who will pay us for solving the problem? And the business model, how will they pay us? Okay, these are key things that the investor needs to understand that you've got worked out and that makes sense. Does that make sense so far? Yeah, good. Um, 
get to the next ones here. Um, go to market strategy. How will you reach the market? Okay, and how are you going to stand up against the competition? Uh, my favorite phrase is sustainable competitive advantage. Um, patents offer an easy, sustainable competitive advantage if you're a high technology company. If you don't have tech, if you don't have patents, then how are you going to protect the business? Because even if you build something wonderful, let's say, okay, somebody bigger can copy the idea because you've worked out, you've done all the engineering and all of the architecture for it. If they can see how you're doing it, they will just copy it and they'll take it to market bigger and faster than you can. Okay, so you have to be really cognizant of how to build in a sustainable market advantage or a competitive advantage. One way is by partnerships. You know, you make a constellation of partnerships. Okay, so that your product is being delivered by the main market players or something like that. But the, the main thing is that you're going to have to put some thought into how can you fight off competition. Because there's two, basically two kinds of businesses in this world. There's execution plays. That means that you have no unique technology. It means you've got to execute in order to be successful. And that means somebody else can copy you and out-execute you and you'll be dust. Okay. The other way is an intellectual property play, where you've got the protection of patents. Okay, and this is a nice thing because this does buy you some protection. You can even screw up on the business side, but if you've got the patents to rely on, the patents have a certain intrinsic value. One of the key values is to keep people from copying what you're doing and bringing it to the market without paying you a license fee. So, uh, I look these days for companies that have some kind of intellectual property that can be patented. Because I've been in a lot of execution plays and they're always a lot of work. They don't have the extra advantage of intellectual property. Okay, so that's just some thoughts on competition. Um, okay, next. What's the current stage of your company? We just formed, we have a team, we're pre-revenue, we've developed our product, but we're pre-revenue. We've started revenue, we've started testing. Investors want to know what is the stage of the company. When you get into investment groups like venture capitals and things, if you're pre-revenue, unless you've got a big fat suitcase of patents that they think are really relevant to the world, you're going to get a lousy valuation. Okay, so we're talking from from the from the standpoint of what I understand about the the startup uh, awards right now. Everybody's pre-revenue. Okay, but you should cover what the stage of the company is and understand that big investors, they like. You know, they like a lot of revenue. They like a run rate of a million dollars. I mean, that's just kind of the minimum that a venture capital will take a look at. They love a run rate of about 10 million a year. Okay, run rate means that you're you're ramping up to do that in the, in the next 12 months. So, you know, institutional investors like a good run rate on revenue. They don't like pre-revenue companies because that's unproven in the market. And since investors don't like risk, okay. If an investor has to evaluate a company about whether this is good or not, or you can just look at the marketplace and they can say, wow, customers are buying this all over the place, Our, it's already validated. So the investor, that saves you the whole, the whole work of trying to validate your company. If the market validates it, it's very easy for investors to say, yeah, that looks good. If it's pre-revenue, then it's very difficult for you to convince an investor that you've got something special. So, Obviously, you guys, I think, are all pre-revenue or just starting on revenue. But when you're presenting to the investor, um, say what your current stage is. Okay? Um, timeline of key milestones. Okay? If you say, we formed a team, we've got our product, um, maybe you can graphically communicate that on a timeline and show you know, the five or six main points that you're going for, where you know, team formation, Product development, product release, you know, market testing, scaling, or something like that. We just give what's your kind of timeline that you're going on strategically. That's an important thing for investors to understand because they'll have to understand where they like to play. Because some angels, they like to get in on good ideas really early on. Okay, so um, okay. Last thing is, um, and what do you need from the investor? Why are you pitching to the investor? Um, we need some money to get, say you've got your milestones out there. We're at stage two, and we need investment to get to stage three or stage four on our timeline. Uh, we, need, we think we need about this much money, okay? And this is what we're going to use it for. 
uh, market introduction, just simple things, you know, three, four bullet points about what you're going to use the money for. The investor wants to know, how are my funds going to be applied to move that company forward? Okay? So those are the six, so those are the six main points that, that I've seen, I do, and I've seen in investor presentations. Um, keep the thing as short and simple as possible. If you can tell the whole story in three minutes instead of four, all the better. Okay? Uh, don't plan it at three minutes, 59 seconds, and then you have to breathe during the presentation and so you go over time. It's better to try to end it a little bit early. So, but try to make all your points. <coughs> the important thing is to not get three quarters of the way through your presentation. Some great storytellers. Uh, Steve Jobs, you guys know. Guy Kawasaki, has anybody seen any of his stuff? Uh, he's written some good books. He's a very good storyteller. Winston Churchill was a phenomenal storyteller. I mean, he had to tell stories about World War II, about Germany, about Russia. I mean, he was uh, great. If you listen to some of his uh, recordings of his speeches, you know, very different than Steve Jobs, but he was a very, very good storyteller. Um, also, President Kennedy in the U.S., he was, you know, he was the president that got the mission to the moon going, you know. Russia had beaten the U.S. with Sputnik and gotten, gotten a satellite into space, got the first astronaut into space, and then he had to come in this situation, okay, and tell a story that got America all fired up. And it really did. That was a gigantic expenditure of time, effort, and resources. And it was the company's, uh, the country's vision for 10 years. So that's just another good example of storytelling. And anybody heard of this book, The Lean Startup? Um, I'm reading it right now. Freaking great book. I mean, I have, I stumbled so much when I look at this. It's like I've made so many mistakes in my life with regards to companies. I wish this book were around 15 years ago because it would have given me a much more not, oh yeah, we're building it because we know it's right. <laughs> you know, it, it would have been a different, a different kind of world for, for some of the projects that, uh, that I've worked on. So anyways, I'm a big champion of this book. Um, you know, they don't teach it in normal business school. I teach at university and I teach very unconventionally. Um, and, and, and it's just amazing the business students that I get have had normal business education so far, how clueless they are about how things really work, how, how, I'll say, how there's a lack of a big picture. Got to have the big picture on things, and, and so many business guys don't have the big picture. You as entrepreneurs, you have to have the big picture, because you got to wear four hats. There is no, oh, I work on this. It's like, you know, the CEO has to understand the technology, has to be the, be the best sales guy in the company, has to understand the finances, has to relate to investors, has to clean the toilets before the big meeting in the office. <laughs> you know, it's like everyone wears a lot of different hats. So there is, there's the, you gotta have the broad view of things uh, when you're running a company, uh, especially as entrepreneurs. So, um, yeah, you're, you're, I'd say this book will, is more valuable than most uh, for your business degrees that you would find at a standard kind of uh, standard kind of business school, um, and I, I like I mentioned, I teach I teach pretty unconventionally, and I make project work and not a lot of reading and remembering and rote testing. That doesn't work very well. But uh, projects, you guys are entrepreneurs. You've got projects, so this will help you fill in some of the blanks. Okay, that's it. Any questions? No, you're stunned and amazed. <laughs> basically, how would you alter your, your pitch when you're, when you're pitching to uh, corporates, basically? Because well, it depends on what, you want, what, be, what do you want from the corporates. Well, you want them to put you into Silicon Valley. Right? Some, <laughs> of the, some of the jury members basically are, you know, general manager of, of Microsoft, uh, uh, Dell, etc. So, you know, they're, they're a bit different than investors. Actually. Agreed, agreed. So, well, so, well I, okay. I said earlier on, know your audience. Mm -hmm. Now, if your audience is a corporate, a you have to say, it's why? A mix. It's a mix. I mean, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, well, you, you can't tell one story for everybody. Stories vary depending on your audience. If you want something out of the corporate guy, you have to understand him. Why is he sitting there? What does he hope to gain from sitting there? 
okay? If he's Dell and he's involved with new business development that will eventually lead to new customers or looking for partnerships, you need to understand that and tell your story in a way, for example, if it's a GPS story, okay, somehow make this relevant to Dell, okay? Um, if it's Microsoft, you, you have to figure out, you have to know the audience and you have to you have to cater your story to meet the goals of whatever that guy has, okay? If he's just trying to get to dinner, okay, and he's out here and he doesn't, he's not going to do anything for your business, he's voting, and he wants to get to the nice dinner and go find some chick at a bar, okay, then make your story close or short and get out to dinner with him and say, ah, I'll help you find a girl. You know, well, I'm just saying you have to meet the expectations of the person sitting in the audience, okay? Otherwise, it doesn't matter what you say. So you have to try to figure out what does that person want? What does he get brownie points for? What does the guy from Dell get brownie points for? What does the guy from Procter & Gamble get brownie points for? He's trying to find companies that can somehow make a partnership, uh, blah, 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 or whatever it is. Understand what they want and cater your story to meet what they want. Then they'll go, oh, this guy's a match for me. You know, So I can't tell you exactly what to say except for understand what their objectives are. Here, I was kind of giving you some insight as to what I think a standard set of objectives for an investor are, okay? Because I've done a lot of pitching and talking. Oh, I was supposed to finish with the story, wasn't I? Um, so, does that answer your question, Yaro? Yeah. So, anybody else? And then if I have time, I'll tell you a quick story, two minutes, on Web Associates getting funded. No other questions? Are you guys all ready to go out and you, give you pitches? You can say the story. <laughs> I'm sorry? You can say the story. Okay, I'll tell the story. Okay. Yeah, maybe then um, we'll be having questions. I'm sorry? <laughs> maybe after that we'll be having questions. Okay. <laughs> okay. So fair enough. Okay. Well, anyways, in Santa Barbara, um, where I come from, it's a nice place. It's a tourist place. It's sunny. You know, all the stuff you see on television. Um, anyways, a small university put together a thing called the Westmont Venture Forum. And this was, the first year was 1998. I, you know, it's a long time ago, I don't remember exactly the years. And my partner Dave and I, we thought, wow, well let's try to go present for this, right? And um, there were not great prizes, but there was exposure to giving a pitch in front of 300 investors. And uh, we said, okay, that's a great goal. We thought we needed investment, which we really didn't, okay? But we thought we needed investment, and by that time, we were at a revenue run rate of about four million a year, four and a half million a year. We were doing quite well, um, but we were always reinvesting everything into the business, so we didn't have any extra cash. So we thought, oh, let's get some investment. We'll grow faster. So there was a preparation phase where people submitted plans, and certain plans were chosen, and then they had workshops, and we got to work with one guy that was super smart and super interesting. Uh, that was the guy that actually ended up investing in us. Um, he was a newly successful entrepreneur and just sold a company to Hewlett Packard, so he was a big, big pocket full of cash and wanted to be an investor. Um, but anyways, uh, we, we worked with him, and it was that personal contact with that coach that, that gave us the, that gave us the, uh, that got his attention, okay? Now, as it was, we still went up and I had to go present. We had 10-minute presentations, okay? I had to go up and present, first time I'd ever done this, 300 people in a very fancy hotel, and I had to go talk for 10 minutes. And my partner is very, he's a writer, so every word had to be crafted to be the optimal words. So I actually had to memorize the speech, and I hate memorizing talks, because it's not natural. That, that fits into the, that fits into the, um, it's not what you say, but how you say it idea. Um, so if you like memorizing things, go for it, but that was, a, that was a counterintuitive to myself. Anyways, we were one of the 10 companies selected to present. We presented. It was a good experience. We had lots of talks with people, but the guy that was coaching us got in and said, after he saw us on stage and he knew our story already, he's like, okay, I'll do something with you guys. So, And what went wrong? That's a much longer story, so not, not for today. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, got it. Okay, good. So, thank you, Mark.